Okay, so I've been asked to go at speed, which was the plan because I've already had two energy drinks because my daughter decided four hours of sleep was enough last night. So we'll see how this goes. Okay, um, the top level bit is, I'm gonna say your mileage may vary here. I do not profess to be an expert on this, even though I am a dirty consultant. Instead, this is gonna be kind of what I've discovered over the last three years around operating models when I was first introduced to the term. And I started asking everyone what it meant and everyone gave me um, really not good answers. So over the years, I've been trying to figure out what they are, how they work, and how they can help. So three um, quick takeaways from today that I'll circle back to at the end. So the first is that operating models are foundations for execution, and I'll explain what that means. They should be lean, learning, and enabling. And again, I'll explain what that means. Hopefully these will make more sense at the end. And the last is you need to enable people with actionable, relevant information. Um, I think for data engineers, that kind of goes without saying. Um, but yeah, I'll, again, I'll show what I mean by that as we go through. Um, this is not, I'm not gonna talk about tools here much at all. Uh, I can barely spell DBT. Uh, I'm not a data engineer by trade, um, but this is kind of more what I do. This isn't solution architecture. This is business architecture. And what the nice thing is, you don't need an MBA or a management consultant to do this. Um, I think that's the important part. Please don't go to one of the big management consultants asking them to do this for you. It doesn't end up well. Throughout the slides, um, you will see a variety of book covers flicking around in the bottom right. I kind of expect that most people are not gonna be well versed in this. So instead what I've tried to do is if there's a particular thing I talk about, you're like, that's interesting, you can either come talk to me and I will tell you to go read the book or you can get it from the slide as we go along as well. Fundamentally, when we look at this stuff, you know, we look at people, processes and tools in that order, you need to make sure, you can't tool your way out of a people problem. People try, it never works. Engineers can only execute the constraint of the systems they inhabit. So there's a little bit of systems thinking going on here, but effectively, it doesn't matter how good your engineers are, if they're operating the systems that don't work, they're gonna look like really bad engineers, uh, which is not great for anyone. And yeah, Conway's Law, which people may well have heard of and was kind of made most famous by the Mythical Man Month, which everyone should read, is effectively what actually decides the system architecture you build is actually the architecture of the organization. As much as we have architecture teams that like to think they decide these things, really it's how the business is architecture that makes the difference. Then you will, um, Team Topologies is probably one of the best books that has come out in the last five years for, for tech as a whole. And they kind of talk about, okay, well actually the way to improve your system quality of the systems you build is actually to look at the way you, in, your teams interact, not actually to focus on the technical architecture so much. And they termed this thing called the inverse Conway maneuver, which I think I'm giving everyone from Corey a PTSD by bringing this up because I know they hear it all the time. So um, today, I'm, this is my fictitious company that I put in every single slide deck. And yeah, that mid journey is fun. I had fun trying to make a business Quokka um, a thing. So Quokka Incorporated, they want to become data driven and AI ready. Who doesn't in the modern day? Um, they've got an existing centralized data approach that isn't scaling, and this is based on my PTSD from working with particular clients when they try and centralize everything and it just falls apart. So looking at data mesh, like data mesh since 2019 became the thing, I think the more I talk to people in data, the more it seems to be where everyone's going. It's kind of one of those things that um, people like to say they do it, but they're actually doing it as a whole of the bit. Uh, I'm gonna go very quickly over this slide about me because it's not that important. Um, I wrote a book, I have three copies. It's about security, so probably not the right audience, but at the same time, security is everyone's responsibility. If you wanna know more about it, then come and see me afterwards. Um, kind of the key point on this slide is actually Beer Ops, which is Australia's biggest tech networking event. It's coming to Perth for the first time this year in November, and we locked a venue uh, last week, and it just happens to be this one. Um, so if you want to come to that, tickets are free. Um, again, come talk to me after about that. So strategy and operating models, the difference between them and kind of why it matters. So I really like, and there's multiple Simon Sinek books in here, um, but I really like this model of the start with why. So you've got these concentric circles of why are we doing something, how are we going to do it, and what are we going to do? And I kind of, and I overlay strategy, operating model, and tools and techniques over that. So strategy is your central, that's your why. Your operating model is how, and your tools and techniques are what are you gonna do on a day-to-day -day basis. Strategy. Why are we 
doing this. So strategies are abstract by design. Strategies are generally with a you know, multi-year kind of time frame. They're looking like, what, what are we gonna try and execute over the next few years to do something? The kind of key point is they enable prioritization. So it's about um, deciding what you're going to do and really, more importantly, it says what you're not going to do. If your strategy says do all the things, you don't have a strategy. <laughs> If your strategy doesn't enable people to understand what they should not be doing, again, I would argue you do not have a good strategy. They don't say how to execute on it, and they really shouldn't, because you're not gonna know exactly what you should be doing in five years' time to execute on the strategy. It's kind of this idea of timelines and time horizons, right? Your strategy's gonna talk to five years. Yeah, cool, but what do we need to do now in the next weeks, months, to be able to do this? And this is where this whole idea of a foundation for execution comes around, which is taken from a book um, from 20 years ago, but it's a, a really good one, actually, on this topic. So foundations for execution are how we organize ourselves to be able to execute on the strategy. And if you ever have someone trying to say, we're gonna do a new strategy, but they're not trying to change how you work, the strategy isn't worth the paper it's printed on. Operating models, so how are we doing this? The best kind of analogy that I've come across is a blueprint. So you're gonna design things in the way that it's gonna work up front. And you're gonna then look at what you have to do to be able to get to that stage of the blueprint. And I'll kind of talk about it a little bit more. It's a source of competitive advantage in and of itself, even though it's not something that your foundation execution operating model, it's not something your customers see directly. They see it indirectly because it's actually how you deliver everything value out to market, but they shouldn't actually know what your operating model is internally, right? The thing is, with data and software, and it's, it's knowledge work, which is kind of interesting when you look at how, how a lot of enterprises especially still take a particularly Tayloristic view of the world. They kind of use management theory from the early 20th century and try and apply it to now, and the reality is knowledge work doesn't fit in the management systems of I'm going back about 100 years now. And really when you look at it, and I was looking at the open AI and chat GPT nonsense that's on everything right now, and Google, whether they said this from position of weakness or not, but they're like, we don't have a moat, neither does open AI. Moats don't really exist in knowledge work. You, it used to be that your competitive advantage, you'd build something that no one could replicate, or the cost to replicate it would be too high. That doesn't really work anymore. Partly because first mover, the whole idea of first mover advantage, which was all the rage 20 years ago, it's, that's, it's not really there anymore. It's all about fast mover advantage. It's about executing quickly and be able to do things faster. It's not about um, being first to market. Even if you look at like the iPod, right? MP3 players have been out for a while before Apple brought that out. They just executed better and faster and are able to drive the market from there. Even Tesla didn't make the first electric car. You know, all these kind of things. It's about executing once you're there. It's not about being the first one to the market anymore, which is, Interesting, it's much better for com competition generally. I mean, the way I like to think about it is when you're building things and you're taking things to market, what you're doing is you're, you're taking bets. You don't know that what you're trying to build, even take this in a data product sense, you don't know that the data you're gonna build is really gonna drive the value that you want. You think it will, you're gonna make a bet that it will because you're gonna invest effort. But you don't know when you're doing product development or anything else that it's gonna work. What this foundation for execution, the right operating model allows you to do is just make more bets. So you've got more chance of being right or finding something that's gonna be valuable. Um, especially enterprises, they get very bad at taking bets because they wanna build everything out and kind of have this confidence there. Startups are very good at making bets, but they don't generally have the capital to make more than one or two <laughs> at one point in time. But the way you need to think about all this stuff is you're making bets all this time. The more bets you can make, the more chance you're gonna get lucky and find something. And there is, you know, as much as everyone tries to think that product development is a science, it's luck plays such a huge part, right? There is no one-size-fits-all approach for an operating model. You can't just take what someone else is doing, yeah, we're going to go do that and it's going to work, right? Like, it's cargo culting, and because it's me and in every single talk I have to do it, safe is kind of this cargo culting approach where it's like you go and do this and you'll, ha you'll do well. It doesn't work like this. You can't just take what someone else has done and go, that's gonna work for us with our culture, with our skills, with our people. It doesn't work like that. What we have found has been effective 
is you build from proven components and you refine them to your context. I'm gonna go through what some of those components look like today with the idea you can kind of take it away and go, yeah, that'll work for us, that won't work for us, that kind of stuff. As I said, I don't have answers, I have ideas on this. So, you know, see how you go with it. And tools and techniques, I'm not really gonna get into much, but obviously that's the what are we doing part. The um, best analogy I could kind of come up with for this, and it's somewhat tortured, is a strategy is you're gonna build a house for a growing family. Again, the operating model is you have the house blueprint that will decide that your plumbing goes to the right places, you have the right plug sockets in the right place, all that kind of stuff. That comes out of the blueprint, right? It gives you that foundation, and then you have to actually build the house. But there's kind of the three stages here, right? The same way an operating model, a data operating model will go, do you have the right people, the right skills, the right interactions, the right structure, to be able to execute on your data vision is different to actually executing on your data vision. And it's different to the idea of the vision in the first place. So it's going, this may look like it's a lot of effort. Um, when I start to go into kind of the details of it, it's probably gonna look, actually that's quite a lot of effort, that's a big investment. And I can't tell you you're wrong on that. It, these things are quite a lot of effort to build, but it, they're incredibly valuable. I'm gonna say kind of why. There is such a danger of tacit knowledge in, in businesses where, well, I know how that works, but I've been here 10 years. Okay, cool, but what about the next person that comes along or people want to move around? There's always this part of like tacit knowledge that people know how things work because they've experienced it. It's a really expensive way to try and get that knowledge out. I mean, um, Chad mentioned institutional knowledge before. Yeah, and I'm going to have that in a second. But some of the, you know, the, the psychology science behind it, there's a concept of Dunbar's number, which people argue where the lines actually go, but Effectively, Dunbar's number is kind of how many friends someone, you know, quote, friends someone can have at any one time is about 150 on average. We are limited in terms of scope of trust and that kind of stuff. You have five really close friends you trust, you know, intimately, and as you scale out, you don't know people <laughs> as well anymore. I've recently gone from a company of 150 into one of 1,000 as part of one of 330,000 there is quite differences in how you can do this. You can't get away with just, well, I know that person because I see them all the time versus we have to get a common understanding everywhere so people can actually understand what's going on. We need, it, we need institutional knowledge, which pretty much comes down to we need to write things down. Things need to be captured in a way that people can view um, asynchronously and not rely on communication, just knowing the right people all the time. What we generally find is we go in to try and do this stuff and we ask, well, how does this work? And people are uh, not really that sure. Okay, well, can you point me somewhere where it says how this is supposed to work? Well, no, no, I can't. We kind of just figure it out as we go along. Okay, the way that we approach operating models um, in, in what we do is we kind of split it into three levels. We have level one, which is a guiding structure and alignment. That's about making sure everyone's gonna pull, pull or push in the right direction. You've got level two, which is teams and interactions, and you've got level three, which is your detailed kind of more day-to-day -day kind of stuff. The only thing I'll say is you have to start at level one, but you can stop at kind of each level as you get through them. Generally, level three, we don't, we have kind of things that we have done for level three and going to that level of detail, but generally we don't do it a lot of the time. We stop at level two, but I'll kind of go into the deal. You kind of see why, um, why we stop at certain places as we go along. The, I think the important thing, that we, one of the most important things that we found is I talk about visual artifacts here, and I am gonna talk about visual artifacts because Every, you know, too long didn't read. Everyone's seen, you know, the stuff that lives in Confluence for 10 years and no one ever looks at. It really makes it harder for people to actually find the information they want. Maybe Gen AI is going to actually change this. Maybe ChatGPT can tell me by parsing all this stuff exactly what I want to know on the face of it. And the caveat, if you're Amazon and you have that writing culture where everything has to be written down, then fantastic. But most cultures are PowerPoint driven for better or for worse. So we try to meet people where they are, where they are and how they work culturally right now. You don't want to start trying to produce a 50 page document that tells them what the operating model is because generally someone's gonna have a question and they're gonna to wanna to find one bit of it, but you know, are you really gonna read 50 pages? No. Looking at the levels in a little bit more detail, the level, the top level is executive level. There's a high impact of change here. If you change anything here, you're gonna see ramifications the whole way down. So this is stuff that you wanna negotiate and get really set in stone because changing it is expensive. And it's all about alignment. The level two is looking at teams, impact is less, and it's more around how you coordinate those teams, and the level three is around execution. Now, people may have read um, a lot of Gregor Hoppe's work where he talks about the architect elevator in terms of the engine room and the penthouse. This is kind of that same approach of horses for courses, 
getting stuff at the right granularity to, to fit the needs of the people who are actually gonna look at it, right? You don't want, and is X not gonna wanna see the super detail of how stuff works on the day-to-day -day ground. All they're gonna see is the high-level approach because that's all they have the capacity to look at and for their purposes, that's all they need. This is the, and don't worry, I'm not going through all of these today. There's not enough time and you all leave before I get there. But effectively, this is all the different pieces as of right now. This is all the ones that we generally use with clients and we have a, we mix and match into the ones we think are gonna be valuable. This is all the different pieces you can put together to try and build up what your operating model is gonna look like. You can find more, there are more as well, but this is kind of what we use. This is kind of the, the everything. And really, when, when looking at that taxonomy, the bigger a space you're trying to look after, like the more people you're trying to do, the deeper you actually go in the model. If you're looking after like a department of 20, 30 people, you don't really need to go to that much detail, again, because you have that ability to trust and know everyone else. You don't need to write things down and define things so much. If you're trying to look after, um, I was doing this with a, um, a bank a while ago, we are looking at the data practice and you know, there was over 100 people in there. We had to go to quite a lot of detail because we needed, we, you needed to have that level of communication between everyone to talk to each, to have that institutional knowledge because people just don't know each other anymore. Um, and you're always making this consistent trade-off through it. You've got economies of scale versus capacity innovation. Now you might look at like, you know, you're gonna go to a heavy level of detail, like, but okay, but now we're trying to tell the teams what to do. And it's like, to a degree, for some teams, you do want to kind of define how they're going to work to a, to a certain level of degree, because it gives you standardization, which allows you to get this economies of scale. If everyone's working completely differently, you don't have a solid foundation to go, actually, we're gonna optimize these things, because instead you're just gonna optimize it for one team in isolation. There is no economy of scale. But you also want to not stifle capacity for innovation at the same time. You kind of need to be playing the trade-offs here, and you need to be saying, kind of, okay, what are we going to try and get an economy of scale out of, and how do we leave the teams with enough capacity to innovate on, on the edge as well? And really, it's like this efficiency versus, versus experimentation approach. What do you need to do efficiently, and what do you need to experiment with, and try and have that segmentation? The... Um, you know, the, there was... Um, Thomas Thwaite did this interesting thing where he tried to build a toaster from scratch, um, by raw materials and doing all this kind of stuff, it cost him over a thousand pounds versus it cost four pounds to just go buy one at the store, right? If you don't have economies of scale and you try and open up the entire world for experimentation, people to figure out for themselves, it's incredibly expensive. And you can't really do that. You're gonna have to prioritize, when you look at the operable, are you trying to prioritize you wanna be able to scale things or you want to go and try and chase new market? You're gonna prioritize one, but you're gonna design for both here. Um, that's fundamentally is you're always trying to do this trade-off. You don't want to just go down one way and leave the others alone. Because um, you, you're going to piss someone off <laughs> along the way. Either people are going to feel they're constrained or people are going to, you're going to end up with 20 different systems kind of doing the same thing, right? So these are the bits I'm going to dive into today. So I'm going to look at what an operating canvas is and the bits that go in that. I'm going to look at operating mode squad structures and shared account with model for level two. And level three, we're going to talk about journey maps. Again, these are the ones I found the best value out of, the most mileage out of. I think they're the most core ones. But as I said, your mileage may vary. You might look at these and think, yeah, that's kind of useful, but wouldn't work for us, or that kind of stuff. Um, again, when you're designing an operating model, these are kind of the principles we abide by um, in terms of what we're doing when, we, when we're looking at these things. Because it's not only to have the principles of how you're going to execute, but what are the principles that go into the design? And those are two different things. So an operating model should be lean. So you want, you know, um, channeling you're in a Goldilocks. You want just the right amount in your operating model. You want to define kind of just the right amount, and I can't tell you exactly what that is off the top, but you don't want to overdefine things. You don't want to tell everyone exactly how they should be doing everything, and then all the engineers go, well, this is ridiculous. You don't know well enough what I should be doing. You need to back off a bit. So you kind of want to, you need to be careful about like less is more here, don't try and define everything. You wanna be making sure you're defining what you need and not everything that you could define. And enterprises again have a habit of over defining everything because they want control, they want, they want to understand everything. It's, well, that's how you kill all innovation. Um, an operating model should be learning. Um, this isn't set and forget. This, operating models are moving targets that are iterative. They're not something you will define once and go, cool, that's a set for the next three years. It doesn't work that way. Instead, you want to be constantly building feedback in and going, this is what we thought was gonna work, we tried it, it didn't work, okay, we're gonna try something else. 
The problem is a lot of the times these things get in stone because they are somewhat successful and they become really hard to replace over time when the strategy changes. So this is, something, this is not something you want to think about. You know, you generally see some bureaucracy or po policy or especially do with regulatory stuff where it's kind of like, you know, oh, but this is the way we do it. It's like, yeah, cool, but we need to do it a different way now. You have to change this stuff and you want people to always be open. The only constant is change itself, right? So even with these things, just because you defined it doesn't mean it's got to, it needs to stay that way forever. You need to be open to change consistently on this. And the last one is an operating model should be enabling. Um, you're looking to help people do their job better. You're not trying to control people in this. You know, when you look at the team topologies and they have the four, um, they have the four team types, the streamlined platform, enabled and complex subsystems, these are all looked at, you know, the streamlined and the other three are looking at enabling streamlined teams to move faster in here. And a lot of what we do in operating models, team topologies is probably the closest thing to a one-stop shop for a lot of this stuff. It doesn't cover everything, but it's probably the best base. But fundamentally with these kind of teams, there's no such thing as a gatekeeping team in here. There's no such thing as we're the team that stops people doing things. It needs to be always focused around enablement. So how do you help people do the right thing, not try and hit them when they do the wrong thing, right? And, and again, <laughs> at Enterprise, and I run into gatekeeping teams all the time, especially uh, in security. I'll say that uh, security and regulatory stuff are generally the people that are the church of no, right? When you're looking at these things, you want to be trying to get rid of all that stuff. It's how do you help people do the right thing and enable them and not focus on how do you get control over everyone. This is another common one that we, um, I've, I've struggled with personally with clients. There's changes done with people, not to people. Quite a lot of the time there are um, leaders that try to go and define this and then go and this is how we're going to happen, right? You really want to invite, you don't inflict change on people, you want to invite people into the change. So one of these things is these are done with a lot of people you need to get everyone involved in the process so they actually buy in and they have the chance to have their say of, as opposed to it's defined from on high and passed down the way. Again, this is one of my issues generally with SAFE. It's defined from on high at leadership and everyone has to fit into that model as opposed to going and asking people on the ground, how do you think you should fit into what we're trying to do, right? For each of the components, it's a fairly simple approach where you workshop with the relevant people, you refine it, you socialize it, and you repeat. You build the feedback in, you kind of workshop to the point where it's good enough. Perfect is the enemy of good here. You don't want to spend all your time trying to get something that's absolutely perfect because you will end up just wasting way too much time. But instead, these are, these are things where, you know, generally workshops, you'll quite commonly have 10, 50, maybe 20 people in some of them just to make sure all voices are heard. And then make sure you socialize and you provide feedback. These are not about like we've decided this in the workshop and that's it. It's about constantly going around and making sure that everyone is happy and has you know, had a chance to have their say, even if you don't have to take all feedback and action it. Okay, um, level one. So I said I'm going to talk about operating canvas. The operating canvas is going to show that it has six different parts to it. I'm going to go over those pretty quickly. Mission and vision statements. I think we've all seen these a million times. I'm not gonna go into the huge amount of detail, but mission is why we exist and vision is what we aim to achieve, or at least that's how we define them. That's, you know, this is classic stuff. This is just your top level strategic alignment to make sure you're plugging back in kind of higher up. Operating models are fractal by design. You'll have the whole business operating model. Then you'll have an IT operating model. Then underneath that, you might have a cloud operating model and a data operating model and all these kind of things. You were able to kind of fractally do that. You want to make sure you're still hooking into the wider kind of why the business exists, what the wider strategy is to make sure you are staying aligned and you're not just kind of going off on a tangent. Performance metrics. I've got a couple of ways of looking at this. This is kind of, these are four categories of metrics we always like to see that we found are kind of um, at least strongly, uh, for us, correlated with um, success over the long haul, is looking at make sure when you're looking at all the performance metrics, looking at how you're going to measure success on this, and metrics are key to this, that you've got some about sustainability, and that's not just ecological sustainability, that's cost, that's people, that's making sure that you're playing what um, Simon Sinek, again, I said he was going to crop up again, um, we'll call it an infinite game. You're not trying to win with this, you're trying to keep playing. That's the idea of what you're trying to do here. So you want to make sure that whatever you're doing is going to live for the long term and you're not trying to take kind of shortcuts out of this. The second one is around, the second set is around stability. This is how you build trust is by building stable systems, data contracts, 
as Chad was talking about, are one way of doing this in a data space. You set expectations and you keep to them and you provide stability here and that enables trust to kind of scale across the business. If you prove yourself to be untrustworthy because you can't keep to what you said, then it kind of doesn't matter what else you're doing at that point because people won't trust you, they won't buy in, they won't use what you're trying to do. The third is efficiency. This is kind of looking after your continuous improvement bit. You want to be making sure that you're consistently doing things better, not just consistently doing things. So this is making sure that your continuous improvement cycles are going. And the last one is team health. You need to be looking after the teams here as well and making sure that they're not overloaded, they're not overstressed, they are sufficiently challenged. Do you have these ways of looking at are the teams as part of the operating model how are they faring? Because you can have a model that looks efficient from that perspective, but it's actually just kind of making everyone sad on the inside. The other, other re a really good model that I like for this as well is looking at the North Star framework from Amplitude, where they've got this idea of a North Star metric here, which is a leading indicator and kind of like your one holy metric, you're gonna chase this period of time. It's really powerful to be able to kind of condense and get it down to this is the one thing we care about above all others, as opposed to having, we're gonna optimize these 10 metrics in parallel. Yeah, right, you're not gonna, you can't possibly do that. Again, this is all about finding, um, narrowing down and looking where we're gonna focus consistently as opposed to looking wide. Um, North Star metric, you can, like, they've got a PDF, it's free. It's, it's, it's a good read for kind of looking at how you could try and do this. When I think about this in a data mesh sense, and even if you read um, Zemak's book and you look at what she said, a lot of it was around, well, you know, it's around consumption of products is your primary metric, not about the amount of products in there, right? So it's about driving value. So having these North Star metrics like that is make sure you're optimizing for the right thing and you're chasing the right goal, not just looking, well, actually, you know, we want more data products. It's like, well, how about we make sure the ones we're building are valuable first? Um, the macro value journey, this, this is just a very high level look at kind of, the, and in this case, it's because I'm talking about data meshes, it's the life cycle of a data product and very, very high level, right? This is just about top level communication that someone coming from another business looks at goes, oh yeah, I know what this is. I've seen this before. It's just getting this kind of common understanding of this basis. It, it, it's just very, very high level by design so people can understand, okay, yeah, okay, I get that. Um, principles. Um, it's always, you know, you need a set of operating principles at the basis of all of this because this is where you get your practices, what you're going to do, this is how you get kind of alignment on how you're going to make trade-offs and what you're going to value and everything else comes from the principles you define. Again, I'm going to come back to cargo culting in terms of if you don't have a set of principles that you truly align with, you're just kind of picking something else up and going, hey, we're going to work like this, that's going to work, right? The principles are kind of foundational to making sure that people are empowered to make trade-offs, that they can, you can actually decentralize leadership out because everyone understands and would make similar trade-offs given the same, um, same information at the time. Maybe not exactly the same, but at least similar. And the last one is just a picture on a page of, yeah, this is just very high level what the system is gonna do. Again, this is kind of like if you've seen C4 models and stuff like that, this is kind of like your super top level one that you're not expecting really much to change, but kind of says, yeah, this uh, super, super high level and this is kind of one for a data mesh in terms of you've got business domains with data products, there's a self-serve data platform, and they're serving a variety of use cases on the outside. Just super simple stuff, but it's just, go, you know, people are gonna come in and say, they're gonna see this stuff, okay, what are we doing? Data meshes, they're not gonna have read the book, they're not gonna have listened to all the talks, and they're not gonna understand it, but this is just a way of going, okay, at a super high level, this is what we're trying to achieve. Um, we like to list some core technologies in there just so people understand what kind of the basic, you know, some of the choice around technology at a high level that have been made. Like you're not going to go, we're going to have Kafka and we're going to have PubSub in a GCP or SQS or whatever. You're going to make some calls here around where you're going to focus for now in terms of the technologies you're going to, you're going to leverage across the ecosystem because that has an impact on the skills, the teams, even the structure of the organization and how you're going to do that. Um, and then ideally you can throw it all together on a page like this. This is kind of just the super high level, this executive level of times of this is, this is our operating model at the highest level we could possibly do. This still has some level of value there. You know, this is easily consumable. It won't get into the details of the mechanics, but it's something people can pick up and use. Okay, I get the idea. I can look at this. I can understand kind of what we're trying to do. I don't understand really how we're doing it yet, but I can understand what we're trying to achieve and how stuff fits together. Okay, um, level two. Modes of operation um, is where we're going to start. So this is something that we have found be really effective in terms of talking about when you've got different consumers, they kind of fit into four different categories, um, which is quite nice. So growth will be your kind of data product teams, the cradle, the grave, you've got this end-to-end -end accountability. These are your teams that you want to enable to go as fast as possible because they're trying to innovate for you. 
You then have Optimize, which is more this, you've got a decentralized build where people are still um, building stuff for themselves, but you're actually trying to manage operations centrally here. So you can look at SRE as a way of doing this and all that kind of stuff as well, but this is where you're going like, well, actually, we want the product teams to be able to move fast, but we kind of want to hold operations centrally because we can get economies of scale value out of that. The third one is Sustain, which is centralized building operations. You know, this can, a uh, classic example I had a, a previous client was running Tableau. So you actually pass that to a platform team to just run Tableau because the team that wanted to use Tableau had no interest in actually running Tableau. But you'll generally see this for kind of the COTC solutions you need in order to make things work. And the last one is just consumption, which is just, we're going to use a SaaS vendor for this. We're going to go get Databricks or Snowflake or whatever. The way we look at it, and yeah, actually that's come out fairly legibly. Um, <laughs> is we have these different models of looking at, okay, how do the teams actually interact to make this happen? And really, this has come back to these different four um, with a slightly different lens on decentralized, hybrid centralized, and buy. This is just a really, in, uh, a really powerful way to just segment different consumers within your stack in terms of how they're trying to do things and understand who you're trying to serve and then what that actually means. I said, back at the top that Qualcomm and Cobb are looking to do data mesh, which means in a reality, they're actually going to look after growth consumers here. You're actually looking after data product teams. You're going to actually make a call that the people that kind of want, you know, you to manage the data for them as a, like a centralized data function, you go actually, no, that's not what we do, right? Again, it's why I'd be able to make these calls on, we're actually not going to serve you. What we want to do is focus on the product teams. So this is just kind of key again, to be able to say, well, we're not going to do that. And people can self-identify into which one of these they fall. Well, we want this. Cool story. That's 12 months away. We've got other stuff we're trying to chase right now. Shared accountability models. So this is something that people will generally be familiar with um, at, or uh, different versions of. And again, we kind of split it into three different sections here. You've got the engineering accountabilities, which are about delivering value. You've got the governance part, which is about enabling value. You've got facilitation or building capability. You want to make sure you actually have teams looking after these three things. Engineering kind of looks after itself. Governance, to a degree, looks after itself, but need to understand how they need to come to the party to enable teams. And facilitation is just that bit of, how do you actually build this in internal capability? When you look at um, businesses going through digital transformation, there's generally a massive transition from outsource to insource. For capability, you need the teams that are actually going to look after building the capability of the whole time and have that be accountable for that because in reality on the ground where you're trying to uh, doing engineering, you're not going to focus on, well, how do we actually build this capability wider within the business? The way I always think about these accountabilities is who is responsible when something goes wrong. This is some, you know, a lot of people are quite happy to take accountability for things when things are going well. What you really want to find out is who's going to be account who's going to be on call, who's going to be if something is problematic, who's going to be the one that actually drives that forward. Um, you know, we found out far too many times over the last twenty years that when actually the banking system fails or the economy starts failing, it's actually the taxpayer that picks it up, not the banks. So you can actually look to actually what really go what's going to really happen when stuff goes wrong as to where the accountability should lie. And one of the important things here is if you if someone is accountable for something but not empowered for that same thing, you've got a real problem. I'm all right on time, aren't I? I've got three minutes. Yeah, I'm almost there, don't worry. Um, yeah, most familiar from AWS, you'll see the shared responsibility model floating around. This one's the one about security, that one's sustainability. The, we have um, a slightly more complex version where we have all these bits and pieces, but I'm just gonna zoom in on the kind of the top left, because that's a different bit. That's kind of the bit that generally varies. So in here, you kind of have machine learning product squads, data product squads, and data platform squads. And this calls out the different accountabilities that each squad is going to pick up as part of this. Now, you'll probably look at this, and you'll probably argue that some of these boxes should be in different places. Fantastic. That is exactly the point. Um, this is where you actually define who's going to be accountable for what. And you actually get these split segmentations of duties. Um, I'm almost at the end, I promise. You might say, you know, this is quite explicit. Yeah, that's by design. You, by getting this stuff down on the ground, you actually allow people to argue with it, which is what you want. You know, this whole idea of Cunningham's law, that the best way to get the, um, the correct answer instance on the internet is to actually put the, a wrong answer up and people will come and correct you. You kind of want to buy into that along the way. Um, implicit stuff is just inherently dangerous because people have different ideas of what is meant. If you can actually put it down and show people, then, they have an, then, then they'll come and argue with you, and that's fine. If you're doing this and no one's arguing with you, it means you're not doing it properly. 
Um, so yeah, coming back to the image solution, I, I'm going to go through the last few slides quickly. I apologize, I had five, I lost five minutes, but effectively this then goes to you know what people and what roles are required within what teams in order to be able to deliver on those accountabilities. So you start to make sure do we have the right skills in the right places? What do our teams look like? And then you can start looking well how many of how many of these teams do we need? What people do we need in to be able to do this? Um, team journeys is just kind of this high level of all the different things that happen across a life cycle, what teams are involved, how do the touch points actually happen. This is normally a good litmus test for if, if people can't put it on a page, if they can't capture this, and this one's a little bit more zoomed in, if they're like, oh, well, I need, I, there's not enough colors, I can't show it on this, probably means you're making it too complex along the way. Um, yeah, I apologize if I'm gonna go super fast on this, but yeah, just to come back around full circle, operating models are foundations for execution, they're about enabling you to take many, many bets and be able to deliver innovation out to the market while also providing some level of economies of scale and really defining what that differentiation is. They should be lean learning and enabling. You really want to make sure that you're open for feedback, you're doing just enough, and you're focusing on helping people go faster, not trying to just control everything. And the last is enabling with actual relevant information. You'll see there's kind of different levels, those different levels are for different audiences. That is by design. You can't build one thing that's going to be everything to every person. Instead, you should be iteratively building out more and more detail to fulfill what people are actually looking at. And I'll stop.